It's the battle of the stalky, the bristly, the rigid, with the ooey, the gooey, the blobby. That's kind of what it comes down to. Those are the two kinds of fiber. You've got soluble fiber, which is literally that gooey it swells up and it becomes sort of gelatinous. It's soluble, water soluble. And you've got insoluble, which is like the cellulose, the fiber that's in plants and things like that, that really doesn't absorb water. It's just quite literal roughage, right? Well, there's some very powerful stuff when it comes down to glucose metabolism and insulin sensitivity, specifically with soluble fiber. So let's go ahead and dive into this. So there was an interesting study published in the British Journal of Nutrition. It was large too. It took a look at 264 people and it took a look at their fiber intake, specifically their soluble fiber intake. And it found that the higher the amount of soluble fiber, the higher the amount of insulin sensitivity or lower insulin resistance. Okay, well, we kind of know that fiber plays a role in digestion and slows down the absorption of carbs and all this stuff. So that probably makes the most sense, but we start seeing some different things. For example, did not see the same effects with insoluble fiber. So if it was just about nutrient absorption and slowing carbohydrate absorption, then the buck would sort of stop at fiber in general. But the fact that soluble fiber had this tremendous impact on glucose metabolism and insoluble fiber did not, sort of tells us that that's not the main piece here. Then there was another piece that gets even more wild, found that when adjusted for body fat, soluble fiber had a slightly weaker effect. So what does that mean, adjusted for body fat? It means there was enough data in this study that when they looked at all 264 people and they kind of broke it down by people with lower levels of body fat and higher levels of body fat, they found that people with lower levels of body fat did not have as much of an improvement in insulin resistance from the soluble fiber. This sounds like a bad thing, but it actually is quite intriguing because it means that something is going on deeper where overweight and obese people are going to have an even more pronounced effect from soluble fiber. That doesn't mean that if you're lean, you shouldn't bother with it, but it leads us to believe that it might have something to do with the microbiome because the microbiome of someone that is obese is hugely different from the microbiome of someone that is lean. Now this may be news to you because it doesn't seem, seems like we'd all be the same on the inside, but what we eat and just our inflammatory markers and our cellular signaling and everything that's going on is different. One of the things we have to look at is when we have soluble fiber, soluble fiber is literal food for bacteria, okay, for our gut microbiome. Insoluble fiber is not the same. Insoluble fiber acts as just sort of roughage. So if you're just trying to poop, insoluble fiber is fine. But if you're trying to feed the microbiome, soluble fiber ferments, it is what is called a fermentable demonstrable. And that means that the bacteria eat it and that ferments into what are called short chain fatty acids. These short chain fatty acids then act as a signal that believe it or not, influences how our cells gobble up and burn glucose. Mind blown. It's pretty nuts. And it leads a lot of people to think, okay, does a probiotic affect this? How does this all look if we're trying to support our microbiome? And the bottom line is a probiotic can have an impact on your microbiome, but not nearly as much as fiber will just by itself. That said, I put a link down below for the probiotic that I use because there's really only one that I recommend. It's called Seed. That link is down below for 15% off if you want to try it out. They've been a sponsor on this channel for, shoot, like three years now. So they're awesome. And that link down below. So Thomas 15 saves you 15% off. Cool technology too. Capsule inside of a capsule. So there's a little capsule inside of a bigger capsule. So you have proper delivery and it's called a symbiotic. So it does a prebiotic fiber along with the bacteria too. So it's a prebiotic and a probiotic. So that link down below, 15% off using code THOMAS15. Now let's get into some mechanics of this so you understand a little bit more of why soluble fiber gives you more bang for the buck. And then also want to talk about what soluble fibers to eat because this is very, very, very important. So stick with me on this. When you eat a small amount of soluble fiber, I'm just going to use very colloquial visualizations here. Let's say that much soluble fiber water is going to get sucked up into it and it effectively mechanically becomes much bigger. So hypothetically, it goes from this to this. So you get more fiber, bang for the buck, from five grams of soluble fiber than you would from five grams of insoluble fiber. So when you're looking at 
carbohydrate count, when you're looking at calorie count and all these things, it's significantly less risk, calorically speaking, carbohydrate speaking, to consume soluble fiber because you can consume much less of it. Okay, now what I also mean is that when you consume this, it's going to swell and it's going to provide a better source of roughage. It's gonna push things through and swells up and sort of squeaky cleans like a pipe cleaner in your intestines, right? It's gonna clean everything out much better than insoluble fiber. That doesn't mean insoluble fiber is bad, but it does mean that soluble fiber is what you wanna lean into. There's a quick test if something has insoluble fiber in it as well. If you were to add water to it, would it turn sort of gelatinous? A perfect example is oatmeal. When you cook oatmeal, it gets kind of ooey and gooey, but if you ate it cold, it's hard, right? And if you added just cold water to it, it would take a while, right? It would take a while for it to get gooey. But if you added hot water to it, it gets gooey pretty quick. And that's just a physics thing and you know, vibration of the water molecules, et cetera, and how it swells it up quicker. Like chia, another example. Put chia seeds in a jar of water, they're gonna swell up and they're gonna soak up a lot of that water. Same with flax. So some of the things that I recommend, things like Metamucil, psyllium, okay? Just getting that, just get straight psyllium, okay? We have very long chain inulin that comes from artichokes. That's why they're kind of slimy, especially when they're warm. That sliminess is soluble fiber. Flax, okay, one thing to note about flax is you really should freshly grind it because it oxidizes very fast. So if you buy flax meal, although it's still great, it can oxidize, so make sure it's really sealed. And if you have like a coffee grinder or something, take flax seeds and grind them into a meal and try to use it as fresh as you possibly can. Same thing with chia. Chia, you don't need to grind. You don't necessarily want chia powder. Regular old chia seeds are perfect just in and of itself. Okay. Also, don't shy away from foods that have inulin in it. Okay, inulin is fine, especially if it's a very long chain inulin or look for inulin that quote comes from Jerusalem artichoke. Like a lot of times good food products that use good quality ingredients are gonna have inulin that is from a natural vegetable source. That soluble fiber is very good. Chicory root is also really good like that. A lot of these soluble fibers get thrown under the bus as bad fibers or bad ingredients just because they might cause some bloating and things like that, but you're not going overboard on them. Okay, these little things are good to add into your diet, especially when you're talking about stabilizing the gut microbiome. So one of the sort of hypothetical things that I'm a big fan of is our microbiome responds a lot to how we make changes. So let's say if I started taking up running and I wanted to run a whole lot. Well, there's good evidence that like marathon runners have a specific kind of bacteria called Villanella. Well, that might be different for someone that's not running, right? So if I was trying to say run a marathon and I was running a lot over the next month, I would actually start increasing my fiber intake as much as I could to support the growth of this new bacteria that feeds upon lactate from this training. So anytime you're making a change in lifestyle, I firmly personally believe that fiber can impact how the microbiome adapts because it has the adequate fuel for new bacteria to potentially grow. Now again, that's hypothetical based upon extrapolated pieces of research. But the thing we have to look at is we can be evidence-based and not evidence-bound, right? What I mean by that is if we only bind ourselves to what is published, we don't look at the hypothetical big picture that could be there, that's not researched yet. So I am evidence-based. I based everything off of what I've seen in the literature, but I'm not evidence-bound, meaning I don't only stay with what has been published because that would just be like keeping the blinders on. So anyway, soluble fiber, as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.